Uh, Patriots History of the United States, Chapter 12, Part 3, Material Abundance, Social Reform. While the nation struggled with Reconstruction, patronage, and Indian policy, the pace of industrial production and business enterprise had rapidly accelerated. Growing industries, increasing immigration, and the gradual replacement of the family firm with the new factory system as the chief form of economic organization brought new stresses. Perhaps because the factories were located generally in the North where the intellectuals were, perhaps because the Negro problem had proven more difficult to solve, and perhaps because Reconstruction itself, in many ways, reflected the political corruption that had characterized the Tweed Ring. Eastern intellectuals, upper-class philanthropists, and middle-class women all gradually abandoned the quest for equality of Black Americans in order to focus on goals they could more easily achieve. Emphasizing legislation that regulated large businesses, the hated trusts, these activists pursued widespread social and economic changes under the umbrella of reform. They also embarked on a crusade to end private vices, mostly exhibited by the lower classes, particularly immigrants, including prostitution, pornography, drugs, and hard liquor. Another group who saw itself as victims of industry and powerful interests also clamored for change, largely through the direct intervention of the federal government. Agrarians, especially in the West and South, detected what they thought was a deliberate campaign to keep them living on the margin. Convinced that railroads, banks, and grain elevator owners were all conspiring to steal their earnings reinforced by a government policy of subsidies and deflation, they too clamored for reform. The two groups, the intellectual reformers and the agrarians, had little in common, save that they both saw Uncle Sam as a combination moral evangelist and playground monitor, whereas upper-class reformers sneered at the rural hicks who wanted to force railroads to lower prices they nevertheless saw the necessity to temporarily ally with them. It would be a long road to the ultimate fusion of the two groups in the Prohibition movement, and for the better part of the late 19th century, they ran on roughly parallel rails without touching. Part of the affinity for government action had come from experience in the cities, where individuals could not repair their own streets or clear their own harbors. Cities had become exactly what Jefferson feared, pits of political patronage built largely on immigrants and maintained by graft and spoils. Political reform, however, proved difficult to come by. In the first place, both parties played the spoils game. Second, individuals did benefit from the political largesse and constituents could, to some degree, be bought off. To the reformer of the late 1800s, the circumstance was eminently correctable, mainly through the expansion of the franchise and through more open and frequent use of the machinery of democracy. Efforts to allow people to bring up their own legislation with sufficient signatures on a petition, known as an initiative, which originated in rural populist circles, but which quickly spread to the cities, or to vote on an act of the state legislature, known as referendum, or even to remove a problem judge or a long-term elected official, a recall, were all discussed frequently. An equally important issue, and one the reformers thought easier to attain because they controlled the terms of the debate, involved public health. Public health, of course, is ultimately personal and not public at all, and, as the reformers found, addressing public health issues meant imposing one group's standards of hygiene and behavior upon others, with or without their consent. But that offensive began inoffensively enough, with threats taken seriously by all, safe water and prevention of fires. Two of the most serious enemies of safe cities in the 1800s, fire and disease, could be fought by the same weapon, water. At the end of the American Revolution, observers were struck by the city's almost incredible absence of the most elementary sanitary provisions. At that time in New York, 
columns of slaves belonging to the wealthiest families each evening carried tubs filled with feces and urine to the banks of the Hudson. Most people simply disposed of excrement by flipping it through the handiest window. Piles of feces remained where they landed until either Tuesday or Friday when a city ordinance required they be pushed or swept into the street. In winter, however, it lay where it landed, where it received the local appellation, corporate pudding. Locals sank wells in the middle of streets, whereupon seepage drained into the drinking supply. Other sources of water included New York City's tea water pump, fed by the seepage from Collect Pond, which by 1783 was filled with dead dogs, cats, rodents, and further seasoned with the laundry drippings of all the shantytown residents who lived on its banks. The United States trailed France and England in that respect. Paris had 14 miles of sewers in 1808, and London began a massive sewer system that was substantially completed by 1865. Yet Philadelphia still depended heavily on its 82,000 cesspools in 1877. Nevertheless, Citywide water systems spread steadily, if slowly, during the century. The resulting improved sanitation was instantly reflected in plunging death rates. By mid-century, typhoid deaths had fallen in Boston and New York and plummeted in New Orleans and Brooklyn. Digestive illness also dropped steadily. Where cholera once struck fear in the hearts of Jacksonian city dwellers, by the time of the Great Depression, it had essentially been eliminated as a major public health threat. Such progress depended heavily on safe water systems. As late as the 1830s, most citywide water systems were privately constructed. In 1800, only 5.9% of waterworks were publicly financed. And in 1830, a full 80% of existing water systems remained in private hands although this percentage had fallen to only 50% by the 1880s. Chicago adopted a modified public system in which an owner of property had to show proof that he owned a lot before he could vote on any levy related to water assessments. Brooklyn, 1857, Chicago, 1859, Providence, 1869, New Haven, 1872, Boston, 1876, Cincinnati, 1870, and Indianapolis in 1870, all had citywide planned water systems. And Worcester, Massachusetts, 1890, had the country's first modern sewage disposal plant that employed chemicals to eliminate waste. By that time, nearly 600 waterworks served more than 14.1 million urban residents. These systems, which used steam pumps, had become fairly sophisticated. Along with cast iron pipes, these pumps provided efficient protection against fire, especially when used in connection with hydrants, which were installed in New York in the early 1800s. By the middle of the century, major cities like Boston and Philadelphia had thousands of hydrants. Still, large-scale fires swept through Chicago in 1871, New York in 1876, Colorado Springs in 1878, and San Francisco on multiple dates, some resulting from earthquakes. Chicago suffered more than $200 million in damage, a staggering loss in the 19th century. In its 1871 blaze, which according to the legend was started when Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern, flames leapt 30 to 40 feet into the air, spread through the west side's downtrodden shacks, then leaped the Chicago River to set most of the city afire. Even the wealthy north side combusted when the winds carried aloft a burning board that set the district's main fire station afire. Ultimately, thousands of people sought shelter in the frigid October water of Lake Michigan. These fires occurred in no small part because many systems still used natural gas lighting, which proved susceptible to explosions. Fire could then spread easily because wood was the most common construction material in all of the largest buildings. The growing number of citywide water systems and fire departments offered a hope of reducing the number and spread of fires. Generally speaking, by 1900, 
most of the apocalyptic fires that eradicated entire towns occurred on the grasslands, where in a two-year period the Dakota towns of Leola, Jamestown, Sykeston, and Mount Vernon were virtually incinerated by fires raising out of the prairies. Even with fire prevention measures, plenty of water and urban fire departments often volunteer, fire-related disasters still plagued America well into the 20th century. Baltimore suffered a two-day fire in 1904, and San Francisco quakes set off fires that paved the way for a binge of looting by inhabitants of the notorious Barbary Coast section of town. Soldiers had to be called in and authorities issued orders to shoot looters on sight. The introduction of electricity, more than the appearance of water systems, diminished the threat of fires in American cities. Before electricity, urban areas had relied on gas lighting, and a leak could turn city blocks into smoking ruins. When electric dynamos began to provide energy for lighting in the major cities, gas-originated fires naturally became less frequent. The introduction of electricity to the business, however, could only ensue after several corporate giants strode onto the national stage. And we'll continue with titans of industry in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.